This module are to understand the main philosophical positions on evil throughout the history of Western philosophy. I'm Akash Singh Rator from Lewis University, Rome. Evil from the philosopher's perspective is a deeply contested concept, so the best thing would be to begin with simple dictionary definition. In the dictionary, evil is defined as profound immorality, wickedness, and depravity, especially as a supernatural force. It's used to describe actions that are deeply immoral and malevolent. Evil can be seen in two distinct ways, the first being as a human phenomenon caused by the actions of persons, in which case it has a moral element to it. The second is as a natural phenomenon caused by events that are geological, such as earthquakes or floods, biological, such as cancer and epidemics, and so on. Evil can also be considered theologically or philosophically. Within the history of Western philosophy, the first prominent approach to evil is theological. Within the monotheistic Abrahamic religions, these mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the problem of evil refers to the conundrum of reconciling the existence of evil in the world as a fact with the existence of a God who is fully good and omnipotent. If God is fully good and all-powerful, why should there be evil in the world? Reconciling this problem is a main problem of the theology of evil, and giving an answer to it is referred to as theodicy. Theodicy is the attempt to reconcile an all-powerful, all-good God with the fact of evil in the world. For non-Abrahamic religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, evil does not necessarily present itself as a logical problem serving to incriminate the Godhead. After all, it's the strict conception of God as being all-powerful and all-good that leads to this uh, conundrum. Moving from the theology of evil, in the philosophy of evil, two of the most prominent early approaches are to be found in the philosophies of Gottfried Leibniz, a 17th century German philosopher, and the philosophy of Spinoza. First I'll discuss Leibniz. Leibniz was, after all, the first person to use the word theodicy. It comes from a Greek word, theos, which means God, and dike, which means justice. So in some sense, justifying God in the face of evil or on the justness of God despite the fact that there is evil. So this theodicy is a, an attempt to justify God and Leibniz's book um, on the, it basically it's shortened to on the origin of evil is the first usage that we have of this term theodicy. In Spinoza's Ethics, a widely read book in the history of philosophy, Spinoza puts forward a proposition that neither good nor evil are intrinsically real they're in fact the result of our judgment. In other words, their um, existence is within our mind as a consequence that we judge something that happens as either good or evil. So take, for example, something that bothered Leibniz and Spinoza a great deal as a terrible earthquake that took place in Europe, in Lisbon, in fact, killed countless number of people. It was difficult to understand why an all-good, all-powerful God would permit something so evil as an earthquake to occur and destroy countless lives seemingly for no reason. Spinoza's approach to a phenomenon, a natural phenomenon that most others refer to as objectively evil, clearly evil, is that the event happened. The fact that the event happened is not deniable, but to refer to it as evil is a judgment in the human mind and not a phenomenon exterior to it. So the, the phrase, the earthquake is evil, is mixing both an objective fact with a subjective judgment. Things like the earthquake that happened in Lisbon 
and the very basic problem of reconciliation of all of the human and natural evils that we encounter each day became such a preoccupation for modern philosophers like Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Pierre Bayle, that one recent commentator has in fact written a book on the history of philosophy which is called The Problem of Evil. She states, in some form or other, the problem of evil is the root from which modern philosophy springs. Evil was also a primary concern for German philosophers Immanuel Kant and GWF Hegel. Kant argued that evil does not have its roots in the limitations of human nature. In other words, evil is a positive phenomenon, contrary to what uh, uh, Spinoza had said, and it's not a deprivation or a deficiency such as a deprivation of good. So within the history of theology, uh, St. Augustine is a prominent theologian who had answered the, the theological problem of evil by removing any positive content to evil. And just like a shadow is nothing but blockage of light, Augustine referred to evil as a blockage of goodness, a deprivation of goodness. We don't refer to a shadow as some positive, ontologically real thing. Just the same, Augustine did not refer to evil as some positive, positive ontologically real thing, but a deprivation. So Kant, when he states that evil is a positive phenomenon and not a deprivation or a deficiency, is making an alternative claim. It, evil is a fact to be reckoned with. It is real and it um, uh, is a, a, a deep part of uh, human morality. For Kant, there is something evil in our nature. Despite his emphatic admiration of our rationality, and ability to apprehend what he called the moral law within. Still, Kant refers to the warped wood, what later philosopher Isaiah Berlin would refer to as the crooked, the crooked timber of humanity, that there's something crooked or warped about humanity. Kant referred to it as the warped wood of the human person. So th this evil is real. It's an objective, positive phenomenon, and Somehow, despite that we are aware of the moral law within and that we are rational beings, evil is something that we perform. It belongs to our nature and it's impossible for us to, to eradicate completely. Hegel, on the other hand, doesn't hold the pessimistic viewpoint articulated by Kant. He comes up with quite a novel solution to the problem of uh, evil in which he, which he manages to do as a kind of theodicy or reconciliation of evil with the goodness of God that unfolds through history. Hegel solved the problem of the human propensity toward evil which Kant had, had articulated by sublimating all human action in history towards incrementally higher goals, towards higher goods and what for Hegel would ultimately be the realization of human freedom. Peculiar to Hegel's work is that the problem of evil is solved historically and not logically or theologically. And it's not solved by an appeal to human free will. Now, if God is the one who is open to challenge either God's goodness, God's power, or God's knowledge because of the presence of evil in the world, there is a way to, to free God from this by saying that all evil is a result of human free will, human action. So God is not responsible. God is left with the choices to allow us to be free, which means to risk the possibility that we will introduce evil in the world, or to force us to be fully determined, which is not the kind of thing that an absolutely good God would do since we recognize freedom as a primary intrinsic good. Hegel's historical narrative is a way of taking that theological solution 
of blaming man for evil rather than God and concentrating on free will. Hegel's historical solution is to state that it is indeed true that there is evil in the world. In fact, he refers to history as a slaughter bench where just like with the earthquake, man is at war with man, we destroy each other, we enslave each other. Uh, crime, robbery, injustice is the order of the day. All of these things are true. Evil has existed, but it has existed for a reason. And the reason is that it is the fuel that dialectically marches or allows history to march forward. If there had not been a slaughter bench of sacrifices, there would have never been the possibility to realize the freedom which we now enjoy as a consequence of those evil events, earthquakes, tsunamis, and evil deeds. For example, Caesar crossing the Rubicon and destroying the Roman Republic and becoming a, uh, uh, an emperor. Throughout human history, we have experienced evil. But without that evil, we would never find ourselves at the end point from which we can look back and say that evil is justified in the goodness that has come out of it. So you see, this is a historical theodicy in some respect. Friedrich Nietzsche is another philosopher who was preoccupied with evil. He wrote uh, one very po popular and important book, Beyond Good and Evil. In this work, Nietzsche undertakes a wholesale attack, not only upon morality or good, but also denying the substantive opposition of good and evil. In other words, if you were to have anything that we can consider positive, then evil must be the underlying or substratum up, uh, based upon which you would conceive of that positive thing. However, for Nietzsche, evil is not a reality. It is a ideology. So unlike the Augustinian attempt to refer to evil as a deprivation of good, the Nietzschean attempt is, uh, uh, Nietzsche is not trying to justify evil or, or, or um, God in the face of evil. After all, for Nietzsche, God is dead. But what he's attempting to do is suggest that evil nevertheless is, has no ontological reality. It has ideological reality. It is in fact the construct of people's uh, uh, um, morality, a sort of uh, uh, creation of conventional morality in order to control or regulate human behavior. Nietzsche's preference is to move beyond both good and evil. So just as Nietzsche critiques morality as something that needs to be surpassed, evil being a necessary component of that dichotomy of good and evil is also something that needs to be surpassed. Nietzsche prefers, like we saw in Spinoza's idea of um, evil being a consequence of human judgment, Nietzsche prefers that we should see things as either good or bad, and we have no need for this concept of evil, which is just an ideological tool to steer us away from doing certain things, and just as the idea of good is a uh, mechanism to guide us towards doing certain things, which are in fact in the interest of others. So for Nietzsche, we should see things as not good and evil, but good and bad, and that means specifically good and bad for me. So self-referential and egotistic. Nevertheless, there's an interesting strange in Nietzsche's thought, which is hard to, to harmonize with other aspects of, of his uh, philosophy, which is that he seems to deny free will. If you deny free will, then you're doing two things within the terms within terms of the philosophy of evil. On the one hand, you are giving up the possibility of blaming man for the evil that appears, and thus evil is back squarely in the hands of God. And secondly, you are 
liberating man from being blameworthy or responsible for the evil that he commits. Since if there is no free will, we're determined to do what we do, and how should we be responsible? For example, in law, if I had no choice but to kill an attacker, then we do not call it murder. We call it involuntary manslaughter. Nietzsche's basic idea in formulating all of these problems about the way evil is generally received in the history of thinking about both good and evil is to free ourselves, to allow ourselves to, 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 to slough off this ideology that we use to control our behavior. And if you read through Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, what you're left with at the end is almost a feeling that it is wrong to avoid arbitrary acts of evil. It's a strange consequence of his philosophy. Other more contemporary thinkers have also been preoccupied with the subject of evil. I think it's fair to say that the most important treatment of the issue of evil in the 20th century has been by the German-American philosopher Hannah Arendt. Uh, Arendt was a German uh, Jew who was forced to flee uh, Germany uh, during the Nazi period. And she uh, escaped uh, from Germany through Spain and took a boat to the United States, went to New York uh, to, to, to teach at what became known as the New School, which was a university basically protecting all of the German Jewish immigrants, em immigrants who came from Germany. But this school had no funding, so she was forced to write for various magazines, just like Karl Marx had done. Certain brilliant minds were never given academic positions, so he wrote for uh, newspapers. And Arendt started writing for the New Yorker. While she was writing for the New Yorker, uh, an interesting thing happened. A man named Adolf Eichmann, who was largely responsible for organizing the trains deporting Jewish people to the death camps. Eichmann was found to be living in Argentina and the uh, Israeli secret service called the Mossad kidnapped him from Argentina, brought him back to Israel and put him on trial. Trial for crimes against humanity, for orchestrating the trains going to the death camps at Auschwitz, at Dachau, Birkenau, and so on. Arendt, having fled that environment, she could have been on one of those trains, decided that she would write, she would go to Israel and cover the trial of Adolf Eichmann for the New Yorker. The, the, the process of writing about the trial each day led to uh, a book of Hannah Arendt's, which, as I said, is probably one of the most important treatments about evil in the 20th century. The book was called Eichmann in Jerusalem, and the subtitle of the book is A Report on the Banality of Evil. And this idea that evil is banal is very profound, and it led to a, an enormous amount of disturbance in the academic community. There were primarily two reasons. The first reason is that a, a banal view of uh, evil seems to remove moral responsibility from those who perpetrated the evil. Now, Nazis and people like Eichmann just put human beings into ovens and and destroyed them by the millions. And one would think that only a monster, only an extremely sadistic person could allow that to happen. To suggest that it's banal, in other words, that it's just an average, everyday, quotidian, run-of-the-mill thing that these people were doing, is, can be seen as deeply offensive to many of the victims of, of the Holocaust. 
another reason that seeing evil as banal uh, raised so much academic uh, uh, debate and discomfort was that if you think back on the history of the treatment of evil that we've been discussing, banality was never an option. There was the possibility of blaming it on blaming evil on free will, of attributing, as Kant did, something deeply corrupt about human character. There was a possibility of saying that evil was uh, just something in the mind. But the, 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 the blunt suggestion that what evil is at its seemingly most radical, and there's nothing more radical than the Holocaust, is just the average everyday operation of unthinking people was shocking for the for the uh, uh, academic community. Another uh, uh, philosopher who who dealt a great deal more with evil in the early part of his career than in the later was John Rawls. John Rawls is widely regarded as the most important Anglo-American political philosopher of the 20th century. He had stated in an early work, what moves the evil man is the love of injustice. He delights in the impotence and humiliation of those subject to him, and he relishes being recognized by them as the willful author of their degradation. You can see that this is precisely the opposite of a banal understanding of evil. Arendt had argued that what moves Eichmann is the fact that if he doesn't do what he's told, he'll get in trouble from his boss. And if he does do what he's told, he will get his paycheck and he will get to go home to his family at 5 p.m. So uh, these are two completely disjoined conceptions of what moves the evil man. There's no question that Adolf Eichmann was the epitome of evil, but Rawls says that he's moved by the love of sadism and the power that he enjoys. Arendt says that he's moved by just everyday operations. We all check in at office, we do what we're told to do, and then we go home. Interestingly, in Rawls, When he had a theological orientation, evil was very prominent. After the publication of the Theory of Justice in 1971, and then later in political liberalism, the, even the word evil disappears from his writings. If you count in Rawls's first uh, known work, his master's thesis, I believe I counted some 80 appearances of the word evil. If you count in his last works, even 700 page works like political liberalism, the word evil appears only four times. So what happens between Rawls's thick notion of the role that evil has to play in human life to this very reduced idea in his later more mature philosophy is that he develops a very minimal anthropology or a philosophy of, of the human person that sees its fundamental aspect as being rational and reasonable, and evil plays a much smaller part. So, in our current time, we're primarily debating the contested Arendtian notion of the banality of evil. This one is probably the regnant, the ruling, the dominant understanding today, even though it's deeply controversial. It's been taken up in psychology, and this is what makes it um, uh, so well known and, and, and uh, uh, mainstream now, even though uh, 30 years ago it was so radical. Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbardo, two uh, important psychologists, conducted a number of clinical experiments in a way to test Arendt's banality of evil hypothesis. Milgram's experiments were called obedience to authority. Zimbardo's experiments were done at Stanford University and they were called the prison experiments. In Milgram's experiment, an ordinary person just like you or me, was told 
that he was going to be involved in a psychological experiment and that he was going to test another person who was randomly selected off the streets just like this person and if that person gave the wrong answer to the test then he was to deliver a shock an electrical shock and these shocks were first very mild and then slowly they would get stronger and stronger such that at the end the shock would deliver a death blow now obviously you would be thinking that if you were sitting in that chair you would object you would not deliver a death shock the sh striking discovery of Milgram was that most people most people who sat in the chair and were instructed by a man in a white coat giving suge suggestive of a kind of authority in fact despite hesitation ultimately murdered the person on the other side of the of the experiment they delivered the final death blow because they were told that these are the rules of the game you agreed to the rules you won't be responsible the authority has told you to do it and the shocking discovery is that evil the ability to murder another human being just because a bureaucrat tells you to do so or you see yourself as part of the bureaucratic apparatus is not just possible but likely philip zimbardo did the same thing in stanford in fact they had to cancel the experiment because it became so violent zimbardo took a lot of students from the around the university and he developed a false prison on the university grounds some of the people were some of the students were designated as prisoners and some were designated as the police or the authorities and he told the police the students who were to be police that they were free and would bear no responsibility to treat the prisoners however they so wish now 24 hours before they were all classmates sitting in the same room friends and so on within three days time the people who were playing the role of police were beating the prisoners so badly and people had to go to the hospital people had to go into psychiatric treatment and the experiment was finally uh, uh, cancelled because it had become so violent what the uh, uh, the lesson in the uh, Zimbardo's experiment once again confirms Arendt's hypothesis that we are not evil people who delight in the destruction sadistic destruction of others and this is the cause of evil in the world we are placed in circumstances sy systemic ones bureaucratic ones administrative ones which in some way bring this out of us and zimbardo's most recent book is called the Lucer lucifer effect how good people turn bad and interestingly it is about the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq when ordinary we would think average American young people turn out to be as diabolical as any Nazi that we had ever seen to sum up in this module we have covered both the theology of evil and the philosophy of evil within the philosophy of evil we've discussed the positions taken by Leibniz who had uh, introduce the term theodicy as well as many of his modern counterparts Spinoza Kant Hegel then we moved on to Nietzsche's discussion of evil which is quite distinct from the main tradition of the philosophy of evil and we concluded with discussions of Arendt and Rawls clearly the philosophical puzzlement about evil is very much alive today